For our final video, we're going to look at the notes and the presidencies of John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson. So get out your packets. And again, I apologize for getting this done at the last minute, but you have the entire weekend to watch the video, get your notes, and take your test and be ready for the constructivist class. All right, so on your John Quincy Adams page, follow along. Uh, John Quincy Adams was born in Massachusetts on July 11th, 1767. He was the son of John Adams, the original John Adams, the second president. He married Louisa Catherine Johnson in 1797 at 30 years of age, and he became a lawyer in Massachusetts. As a politician, he was a U.S. Senator from Massachusetts. He was the ambassador to Russia and Great Britain and he died in 1848, a very important year. Lots of revolutions swept through Europe in that year and in the United States, um, we, were, we were in the middle of it, the Industrial Revolution and lots of great changes. All right, so John Quincy Adams, I can't figure out how to make the slide, ah, there it goes. All right, uh, he was president from 1825 to 1829. He only served one term and um, the election where he was elected and then the next election was really marked by sectional rivalry. If you remember, sectionalism is where people are only devoted to their section of the country. Uh, so, yeah, each section wanted their own candidate elected, and the three sections were the Northeast, the South, and the West. And between these three, well, four men that ran for president, John Quincy Adams ended up winning out, but um, many of the Americans were unhappy what happened is the Northeast kind of stuck together and voted for or elected Adams, and the other two sections were split between William Crawford, Henry Clay, and Andrew Jackson. Now, what we really focus on during John Quincy Adams' pres presidency is the growth of transportation, and especially the building of the Erie Canal. And uh, here in Gloversville, you live no less than 10 miles from the Erie Canal. And it's really an amazing piece of, of engineering, an amazing accomplishment. And um, it's, I don't know if it's the longest canal in the world, but it's, it's got to be close. Uh, and for a long time it was. So lots of, lots of technology um, went into it, a lot of hard work, blood, sweat, toil. It's amazing. It goes from Albany all the way to Buffalo. And... Um, it connects the Hudson River with the Great Lakes. So after the Erie Canal was was uh, put into operation, ships could travel all the way from anywhere, from Europe, uh, from the coast, all the way from New York City up the Hudson River, and then west to the Great Lakes. And from the Great Lakes, you could get to all that Northwest Territory, Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, um, and in Wisconsin, all of those big cities that would start to grow, Chicago, Detroit. Uh, so very, very important waterway. It, it was the most important transportation route between the East Coast and the Western farmlands and cities. So shipping costs were reduced by the Erie Canal because, as you know, shipping on water is way cheaper and faster than moving goods shipping on land using... using um, roads and wagons and animals. Um, look at that little table over on the top right. Um, uh, the canal boat, it cut the time that a uh, that goods were transported from 21 days to 8 days. And the cost, it's one-tenth the cost shipping by canal rather than a dirt road. So, um, I mean, the, the Erie Canal revolutionized shipping and transportation in the early 1800s and all the way through the 1900s and um, even today the Erie Canal is still used not even nearly to the extent it was but it's still an important lifeline between the Hudson and the Great Lakes it is 363 miles long it was dug by hand I mean that's amazing They're, they use dynamite but also mostly it was dug by hand by Irish immigrants um, it, from at any one point, it is 28 to 40 feet wide, 4 feet deep, and there are 84 locks. And locks um, hold the water back so that the canal, as you see here, it goes from 
the canal goes from 500 feet in height all the way down to 200 feet in height from Buffalo to Albany, uh, from the Great Lakes to the Hudson. So um, it's really a marvel, a marvel that we're going to watch some videos about, hopefully. Um, the way that it worked is after it was dug, these huge barge ships, um, or bar well, just barges, it's a type of ship. They'd be pulled by mules or horses all along the canal. So on each side of the canal is a road that people would, you know, lead their horses, lead their animals on to pull these uh, canal boats, these canal barges. Um, all along the canal, towns sprang up, and all along the canal, farms sprang up because the canal was a great source of water for for farmland and you see that as you go through the Mohawk Valley um, the town of Fonda and Fultonville and Canajoharie and Nelliston Fort Plain and um, all along and Utica they're all canal towns where people would stop after a good 20 miles or so and they would have a, a place to stop and rest water their horses feed their animals and um, unload some goods maybe pick up more and then move on uh, the Erie Canal was built by hand over an eight-year period of time. And in the end, Governor DeWitt Clinton, and you can see in this picture, he's pouring a container of water from Lake Erie into New York Harbor during the opening ceremony of the canal. This was huge. This was extremely uh, impressive. The whole world looked at New York State and saw that we were doing some re something really great. Um, so... Hopefully you can get into studying the canal a little bit more, and since you live right near it, you really should take any, every opportunity you can to go and visit one of these places, the locks, or even the old sections of the canal that are still, that are still here. Here's how a lock works. Uh, locks were used to get boats up and down between different levels of water, because the point of the canal is how do you get from the Hudson, which is only 200 feet high, up through, going upstream, to the Great Lakes. And so what they did was they used these locks um, where they would uh, build this little this little section where the boat could go in. There's my mouse. Can go into this little locked locked up section. Then it fills with water and then the ship the boat can sail out or be moved out um, onto the next level of water. And it's just like stairs. Think of a lock as work, working like stairs and lifting your foot up to the next level of the step and then up to the next and up to the next. So if you looked at the, uh, at the Erie Canal from a bird's eye view, you would see stairs the whole way from Albany all the way to Buffalo. Um, here's an, a picture of a canal boat loaded with hay. You can play on it in the winter because it freezes over and it's nice and flat. Um, any kind of cargo could be shipped on it, and uh, can, there's a canal boat being pulled by a mule team, and up on the top there you see a tram, or like a cable car type of thing, going over a bridge. So um, as time went on, the canal still was used, and it was widened at some points, at certain points along uh, its existence. Eventually, we the New York State Canal Authority turned the Erie Canal into the Barge Canal. And what they did basically was they they dammed up, not dammed up, but they locked up the Mohawk River. So um, uh, some places you can see the canal off to the right or the left side of the throughway, and then you'll see the Mohawk River next to you. And ships are usually in the Mohawk River now rather than the canal. Um just because it ended up being cheaper to block off the Mohawk River, which was already there, rather than using uh, digging digging the Erie Canal. Here are some other pictures. You've got four different locks in this picture to get a ship from um, from one level to the next on the on the Erie Canal. Again, it's it's kind of like a road. It's it's a road built for ships for boats, rather than just using the natural waterways, rivers, and streams. Um, it's a road that can be controlled, it can be um, widened if necessary, it's, it's safer, it's really awesome.
then there's the Erie Canal song, and I don't know, a lot, not a lot of kids know this song anymore. So if you want to get some extra credit, or if you want to really wow me, and um, or Mr. Wagner, you can find the words to the Erie Canal and sing it, or even just mumble it at us, and we'll give you mad props. Okay, our final president that we're going to study is Andrew Jackson. He was the seventh president of the United States after John Quincy Adams, and he served two terms from 1829 to 1837. He was born in South Carolina on March 15, 1767. He was married to Rachel Donaldson Roberts in 1791, and he was a lawyer in Tennessee. He served uh, politically and militarily. He served in the Continental Army during the American Revolution. He was very young, so um, he just... He was young, but he still served. He was a major general of the American Army during the War of 1812, and his real claim to fame militarily was um, during the battle at the Battle of New Orleans against the British. Now, peace had already been settled, but the British and the Americans still had a battle in New Orleans after the treaty was or after peace was declared, and they they really stomped the British. And so he, of course, would be the hero of that. Um, he also fought Indians out west, so he was he was used to fighting, used to battling. He was from the west, so he was seen as less cultured than those that lived in the east. The west was seen as wild and backwards, and um, he, you know, was he was rough. Uh, he was a U.S. representative and a senator from Tennessee. And he died in 1845. So keep that in mind that he's he is seen as somebody who is an outsider, who is born out in the woods somewhere. Um, during his presidency, he ran as a candidate for the newly created Democratic Political Party, and this party replaced the Democratic Republican Party, which, as you will remember, uh, was the party of Jefferson, and. Um, the Democratic political party was it continued to be this the party of the people rather than the party of the rich and the and the federalists at this point the federalists were gone all of the original questions and problems that um, the federalists and anti federalists fought over were were solved and the country was humming along uh, now Jackson started what it's not really novel, but it's it's human nature. He started what's called the spoils system. That's the practice of giving government jobs to political supporters. That only makes sense. If somebody helps you get elected, you're going to give them a job in government. Whether it's right or not is up for debate because you want the best person in the office or in a, in the position, um, not necessarily just your friend. So he fired some government workers and he replaced them with his own supporters. And people saw that as a as like one step towards the president having too much power. Um, also during his presidency, northern and southern states argued over tariffs. And tariffs are a tax on goods. So President Adams signed a new tariff and President Jackson supported it. The tariff placed high taxes on imported goods. Now, northern states wanted it because it protected their factories from imports. So people um, in the north, they said, hey, we, we are making goods such as, say, chairs, tables and chairs, but we don't want to compete with other countries' tables and chairs. And so the government would make the outside country tables and chairs cost more than American-made, northern-made especially. So um, the northern saw this tariff as good. Southern states, though, didn't want it because they didn't have many factories in the south, and they imported most of their goods from Britain and France. So uh, the north, they don't want British and French goods. In the south, they do want British and French goods. So the south ended up having to pay more for their goods. And the north said, well, fine, pay more for outside goods. We make our own up here. Um, now, it got so bad that South Carolina even threatened to leave the Union. Uh, Southerners said that Congress didn't have the right to pass tariff laws, only states could do it. And so this argument between states and federal government power started to rear its head. Um, this issue here, you see states' rights. We're going to see this again a lot, uh, especially going into the Civil War.
And you even see it today where people say, you know, the federal government shouldn't be able to tell us uh, what to do in certain, cer certain circumstances. Instead, the uh, states should be making these decisions. Uh, John Calhoun of the South, he supported states' rights, and he's going to end up coming up again. All right, so states' rights is the idea that state governments were more powerful than the federal government. And that's a problem. We, we've seen this before. This argument came up during the Articles of Confederation. And because of states' rights, our country was very weak overall. All right, uh, Daniel Webster in Massachusetts, he argued against states' rights. And he said the Constitution created a government where the federal government was stronger than the state governments. That's called federalism, where the powers are shared. Now, there's a difference between shared and one having more power than the other. Uh, so, you have to think about that. Uh, Congress, in the end, reduced the tariff to satisfy the South, but the southern states still weren't happy. They said, we don't want any tariff. And so, again, South Carolina threatened to secede from the Union, and secede means to withdraw. They said they're going to quit. They're going to leave the Union, start their own country. Um, so because of that threat, Congress passed another law lowering the tariff again. And after that, South Carolina was satisfied and conflict was avoided. Now that's what usually happens. Um, if there's something that Congress passes that's unpopular, states will threaten different things. They will secede. They'll threaten to not pay their taxes. They'll do all kinds of things to try to get Congress to do what the states want. Okay, during the second term of office, um, President Jackson became very powerful. A lot of people saw thought that he was acting like a king. Um, he would just veto anything that he didn't like. And he, try, he didn't really have to work with Congress because Congress was democratic from his party. Uh, there was just not a lot of resistance to Jackson and his policies. Um, so there were many good things that Jackson did, but also some really, really awful things too. Um, his Native American policy is seen, seen as extremely damaging. Um, so it, what happened is, as you can read through here, many Americans wanted all Native American tribes to be moved west of the Mississippi River. And, uh, so Americans wanted the rich, fertile land east of the Mississippi River, but also they wanted the gold that had just been discovered in Georgia and at northern Alabama. So all these Native Americans were sitting on top of gold and good land. So President Jackson said, all right, you're all moving out. So he moved, um, he, he got some tribes to agree to move. He forced others. And so the Soak, Fox, Seminole, Wyandotte, Creek, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Potawatomi, Chippewa, Ottawa, and Cherokee all moved west. And what we focus on here in this course is the Cherokee and the whole movement called the Trail of Tears. Because in 1838, 15,000 Cherokees were rounded up and they were forced to move west. They uh, walked over a thousand miles over a four-month period, and about 25% of them died on the trip west. And now... Um, it's, it, that's sad in itself, but also the Cherokee were seen as a westernized tribe. They acted like Americans. They wore American clothing. They ate American food. They had American-type government. They even appealed to the Supreme Court to, for protection from this, uh, from the Indian removal. So, in the end, it's like he was moving people out that, yes, they were Native Americans, but they were embracing American ideals even. They had schools that taught American history. I mean, it was just awful what he did to these people. Um, and so here's a picture of the where the tribes came from and where they were pushed to. They were pushed out west here to Oklahoma. And if you've ever been to Oklahoma, you know that it's very, many parts of it are just a wasteland. It's desert. It's awfully cold and horrible weather and poor soil. So these people that were used to hunting and farming even, they just didn't do well. And still today, Native Americans are in such poverty for a variety of reasons. And one of them, well, those reasons is that they're on land that's no good. So it's really heartbreaking. Um, yeah, the Cherokee were referred to as the civilized tribe because they tried to fit in with the white culture. 
they adopted many customs of the white culture like farming schools european style housing uh, european style clothing um, and you can see here this just looks like a regular town and this guy looks like a regular dude a regular american but he's a native american he's a cherokee so it's really sad that these people were what what happened to these people There's a picture of the uh, Native Americans being rounded up and being sent on their trip from Georgia to out west of Oklahoma Territory on the Trail of Tears. Um, yeah, the, so the reservation system was created um, and General Winfield Scott really pushed, forced these, these uh, Native American tribes west. So, the end of our unit here, we have Andrew Jackson as president. By his second term, though sectional differences were becoming very clear within the United States, the issue of tariffs, slavery, Native Americans, and government powers all were like seen in the shadow of sectionalism. This anger, mistrust, tension between the North, South, and West. And so, after uh, Andrew Jackson, we have another nine presidents that are going to have something you know going to that are going to push us towards this oncoming uh, civil war in 1861 so good luck take your test get over a 70 have a good weekend and we will see you next week hopefully in the constructivist classroom and if you don't choose to do the constructivist classroom you'll be in the um the standard class, and that'll be okay too. So, good luck.